Hello my friends and after a few people have expressed an interest in more of the old Kit Car Magazine reviews and updates uh, here is another one. This time I'm looking at the May 1987 Witch Kit. Now this was an interesting time because the Kit Car boom started about 1980 around the time that Triumph and MG stopped making sports cars meaning it was very difficult to buy two-seater sports cars and this has caused an explosion in the number of kit cars but by the late 80s early 90s there was a move towards more quality and it was like a changing of the guard and uh, in 1987 one of the things that was uh, developing because of the confidence in the kit car market was a move to genuine exotic cars not Volkswagen based exotica that had been in the 70s and early 80s which looked fantastic but couldn't deliver on the road there was a big push for something that could really do the deal um, the first car that really nailed it I suppose would be the kit deal Ultima by Lee Noble now that started out in kit car racing and by now it was in the Mark II phase and uh, it was the catalyst that led to others an enterprising couple of gentlemen there's the front of the magazine you can see a prover on the cover um, had taken some moulds off um, a Lamborghini Countach that was on uh, hire as a rental car and uh, they uh, they basically started working on producing their own kit which was to be called the Venom or a variation on their moulds became the Venom. Um, by the time this magazine had come out Venom had disappeared and there was a race amongst several other manufacturers to do the first Countach kit that was uh, buildable. So this magazine features an update on the Countach uh, story. But anyway, let's have a look at what's in the magazine and uh, see what uh, if I can update you on things that have happened. First thing, an advert for Eagle Cars. Now, there's a good example of the Exotica that uh, couldn't deliver the goods in the early 80s. With the Eagle SS, which was originally built in America as the Cimbria SS and by the way I have a friend over there who still produces those so um, we'll uh, have to go over someday and have a look because he's just taken over the Sterling which is originally the Nova taken over to America relaunched as the Sterling and the Cimbria SS is one of a series of cars that were developed from the Nova and this one had gullwing doors and it came to the UK as the Eagle SS keeping the gullwing doors but one of the problems they had was such was the steep rake of the windscreen that the roof would sag whilst you're building the car and then the doors wouldn't close so Rob Budd who by now had taken over Eagle Cars did a big quality push and he put a roll bar in the back of the interior which wasn't the most elegant solution but it kept the roof up and as such the sagging roof thing uh, was said to be history and they'd already developed previous to Rob Budd a Cortina based version so it's a front engine version with a bonnet bulge and I've always had a soft spot for these people say oh they're hard to build they're ugly they're you know it's not the real deal and all that kind of thing but I'm talking as a kid at the time. I mean, when I first saw them, 1983, I was 13, so quite uh, impressionable. Now, an XJ based Daytona replica. The first Daytona replica in the UK was, if my memory serves me correctly, was a Robin Hood. Now, this is the same Robin Hood that made the Sevens, but in the early days they did body conversions turning the Rover SD1 which many say was based on 
the Daytona in looks anyway into a Daytona replica and in this piece they now do a version that can be built on a Jaguar XJ6 or XJ12 floor pan which is getting close to the exotic donor uh, requirements of a Daytona and they're selling these at five six six five thousand you know five thousand six hundred and sixty five pounds plus fat now that's a lot of money in these days never mind then but uh, the Daytona was another thing that was booming at the time uh, it was started by McBurney in America but we'll come back to that uh, right on page five we have a Conan Countach replica another of the Countach clones now I'm not sure this one apparently is based on um, the uh, Lotus Esprit chassis so or the, the prototype was based on a Lotus Esprit chassis so it's not surprising to learn that this one didn't last very long I don't remember seeing any built apart from perhaps the prototype page seven page six the RT roars in uh, this is the Ram RT now this is another of the Daytona replicas now Ram I'm a big fan of Ram they did a Cobra replica which had a space frame chassis by Adrian Reynard no less so we're talking about something that really handled even to this day it's one of the the sought after Cobras and they built a very nice um, Daytona replica and there's a uh, the ch ch body chassis kit price is 3550 plus fat given that it's RAM that's a that's a fair price. The Daytona replicas didn't last long, as you will have seen if you looked at last month's or last week's um, episode six of the Alternative Car Show, and I su suggest that you do go to that. You'll see a McBurney Daytona replica, and I kind of explain what happened with those in the video, uh, so I won't spoil it for you, but do go and look at that video because quite a lot of the cars that are featured in here were actually uh, you'll find you'll be able to buy one from Baz at the kid car collection ah an advert for the Pimlico now this for me is the best styling update of the original Mini that's been done it was done styled by Richard Oakes the fiberglass glass was by Ingram who was very well known for the quality of his fiberglass and it's a GRP monocoque so we're talking about a reshell of a Mini that actually looks for me slightly better than the original it's nicely updated subtly done and uh, I'd I wish to see more of these restored because there must be quite a few out there if you've got one let us know we'll come and take a look uh, there was one in uh, Holland or well, three of them actually and if you look at episode 4 of my original road trip to Sweden, you will see those cars. Right, we have an advert for the Triple C Challenger. A beautiful, beautiful E-Type replica that unfortunately, according to uh, my friend Steve Hall, the moulds got cut up. How, what a tragedy. What a tragedy. I mean, an E-Type replica now. That would sell like hotcakes. Ah, oh, look at this. An advert for the UVA M6 GTR. They only produced a handful of these. Uh, a GRP monocoque central tub. Sub, steel subframes front and rear. Um, Rover V8. Beautiful car. The raised headlamps looked a little bit ugly, I'll be honest. But that was such a beautiful car and deserved to do better than it did. And if you look at our West Anger episode, you will see uh, we took a quick look at that. Pilgrim Hawthorne, which is a nice, tidy-looking little car from Pilgrim. 
based on development of their their marina based uh, chassis for the Bulldog and uh, yeah it's a nice thing not many builds they soon replaced it with their Cobra replica and the rest is history uh, Covin replica uh, Covin Porsche replica advert I know a chap who's got one of those hopefully we will be able to do a feature on the finished car uh, because he's rebuilding it at the moment no pressure mate and there's uh, an advert for GTM with the coupe and the Rossa Mark 1 now I like the Mark 1 Rossa it's closer in styling to the original GTM than the later ones if you look at the feature we did in episode 6 on Baz you'll find he's got a couple of Rossas he's got a Mark 2 which had the sloping front and he's also got a K3 which is the Mark 3 which used Rover K series running gear now I've driven the K3 and what I can tell you is this it's a nice car nicely built GRP monocoque removable roof um, but the gear linkage on all the GTMs was something of uh, a, a, a bit loose it wasn't quite as, as good as some other rear wheel drive uh, mid-engined gear linkages so if you could crack that you've got a cracking car so anyway if you want to buy one get in touch with Baz at the kit car collection Baz I hope I'm getting a commission on these sales right bright wheel Viper V8 tested now this is yet another Cobra replica Cobra boom started in the early 80s with the DAX and progressed with lots of different variations and different prices and different qualities. Uh, the cream rose to the top and the others uh, uh, slipped away but the, the, the bright wheel Viper was based on the Sheldonhurst which was based on a Ford Granada running gear so that was a bit different to the other Cobra replicas and for that alone deserves a mention but uh, by all accounts it ended up in a big uh, argument between manufacturers in the end and the car disappeared which is sad now Hampshire Classics new owners of the Moss sports cars Ah, now I like the Moss range uh, John Copperthwaite designed them and uh, he was an eccentric to say the least and a bit of a genius um, the roads turned the Malvern loosely based on a, on a um, Morgan but not Morgan replicas just very loosely based very nice cars in their own right based on the Triumph um, Spitfire or Herald running gear as was the Monaco which was a crazy crazy cigar shaped um, 1950s race car look-alike and by all accounts as scary as hell to drive because you are so exposed you're sitting on it rather than in it right turning over we have NG cars um, again very good quality NG if you can get hold of an NG uh, do so they're very good quality 30 style cars and sought after whoops something fell down behind me right another kit is the Karma advert below now the Karma was a very loose uh, replica or look-alike of the Ferrari Dino um, nice car nice car nice nice quality for a v VW based kit they now then did a V8 version um, with a steel chassis and I know that a few of these got made because Baz had one at the kit car collection get in touch with him if he might still have it around I don't know and then there's a feature on a Countach countdown looking at the progress of various manufacturers who built cars or are about to launch re their replica uh, in 1987. The leader of the pack has to be the Prover. Now this was developed from 
Venom body shell and they went to kit deal and it used a version of the Ultima chassis I think down the line they sort of separated went different ways and the Prover chassis was further developed on its own and if I'm correct Prover have just gone back into production uh, the Prover so you can still get one of these Kuntash replicas so let's be honest it's not going to be an easy build at all any of these so there's an update here on the progress of the Prover and the other replicas now the Prover um, as I said is still available GB Racing Cars did a replica using Jaguar V12 I know a few kits were delivered I've seen a body shell that someone got in part exchange for a kit another manufacturer I've never seen a finished one so if you have a finished GB Kuntash replica do let me know, we'll come and do a feature because I think people would be interested in seeing it. And GT Developments, they of the fa uh, famed for their uh, GT40 replica, they did their own um, Kuntash. It didn't last very long. Um, they stuck with the core, which was basically the GT40, and they went on to do a GT70. Sorry, that's my phone sending me messages. Um, and uh, so they didn't really sell a lot of Cobras there's my phone again, sorry about that, I'm not going to stop uh, adverts for the Prover, uh, unique autograph, the Python now they are still going that says a great deal about the quality of that kit I need say no more a big advert for the Viper V8 I won't go any further on that, I think I've said all I need to say. A competition to win a Challenger worth £3,000. Whoever won that, I hope they built it because that Challenger E-Type replica is gorgeous. If you've got one that's built, give us a call. Again, we'd love to come and do a feature on you and your car. I mean, uh, it's a great pity that the moulds got cut up. I mean, a, a E-type replica would sell like hotcakes now. An advert for the Ram RT, which is their um, Daytona replica. Um, again, if anyone's got one, let us know. But I'd really love to do a feature on Ram. You know, a Cobra and a Daytona would be fantastic. Um, let's go on. An advert for the Bulldog, which is the other model produced by Pilgrim and the GB500S advert for their Lamborghini replica again did anybody produce one and above that some uh, uh, information on a, a, a mishap that happened to the demonstrator of the Carlton Commando uh, sorry not Commando the Carrera now this was a, 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 a loose look-alike of the E-Type but cleverly it used Ford Capri glass and Ford running gear later they used Jaguar running gear if you've got one and it's running let me know we will be straight down to do a feature if you've got one that needs restoring let me know um, again we would be interested in getting one of these cars back on the road if not ourselves we would definitely flag it up for someone else because it's a usable everyday car and not a lot of kit cars are. Now, here's a feature that's interesting. Basically, it covers the Lotus replicas that were around at the time, and there were quite a few. Now, they actually include the Caterham 7, which is a continuation of the actual Lotus 7. So, they do explain that in the article, um, and because it's a kit, it makes sense to include it, and it's still available and I don't need to tell you how good the quality of Caterham are so that's you know uh, uh, by the side now the interesting bit is the next two cars the Westfield 7 and the Westfield 7 SE now the Westfield 7 was so close in specification and looks to the Lotus and the Caterham 
that uh, it caused a bit of grief. Now this was the second model by Westfield. Uh, Chris Smith, who started Westfield, uh, made a name in racing Lotuses and in restoring Lotuses. And his first kit was the Westfield 11. We'll come back to that. But the Westfield 7 was another seven uh, uh, West uh, Lotus replica uh, by Chris Smith. And it was, to all intents and purposes, near identical in specification. And it was really good handling. It was probably, uh, if anything, slightly better than some of the newer ones that came later. Um, it was so close, in fact, that uh, Caterham didn't like it at all. They did a cheaper version called the Westfield S7 SE. Now, that's significant because they moved away from mirroring the donor's running gear that was used in the Caterham to more escort running gear. At a later date, if this all came to the head when Westfield were taken to court by Caterham over copyright infringement for the close replication of their car. As a result, Westfield were ordered to change the styling of their car. So they put swage lines down the side and on the wings and they went with the chassis from the Westfield 7 SE and further developed that um, and that became the stock Westfield model and to my mind it's actually better looking than the original pre-litigation Westfield and this caused an explosion in Westfield sales. Westfield differed from Dutton in that they did produce lots and lots of kits but they made them so that they really fitted the kit ideal that most people in the street had imagined which was something like an airfix kit. The Westfield went down the line of like Caterham everything will fit and as a result Westfields flew out the door they produced thousands of them and they're still producing them to this day the cream rises to the top and that was a big part in the end of the, the road for Dutton because the quality improvements that Westfield and other manufacturers of their ilk um, produced made it difficult for Dutton to keep up they were still producing cars in the same way they were in the 1970s and they were so cheap that it was very difficult to upgrade a great deal uh, without changing the price structure. The price structure was part of the appeal of the Duttons and the greater qualities of Silvers and Westfields and other manufacturers made it the deficiencies in, in, in the, the, the Dutton in terms of you had to do more to build a Dutton, you had to have, it was a bit more like a, a hot rod or a custom car. You were expected to do more, make more bracketry, make more, you know, uh, work around little problems like holes not being drilled and things like that. Whereas with the Westfield, everything was pre-drilled and everything fitted and it created the model for future kits. And it was this sort of time when uh, this changeover was happening. Um, the Westfield 11 I've mentioned was the first replica uh, by Chris Smith and was based on midget and spridget running gear and is still available today. Uh, the reason it went out of production briefly is because the headlamps are too low to go through IVA and SVA. So now you can't buy them to use uh, to, to make road legal. You can use them on as track day cars and they handle beautifully. I mean they were right up there in the early days of the kit car racing series. They were challenging for wins in their class. So we're talking about a very well developed car. As was the Ultima Shapecraft Lotus 15 replica. Now the Lotus 15 like the 11 was basically a Lotus racing car but they lowered 
the uh, scuttle height because they could use the more compact Coventry Climax engine and this changed the style over the 11 that preceded it. Frank Costin designed the aerodynamic body on both and they really were cutting edge in terms of aerodynamics and very successful in racing and the Shapecraft uh, uh, replica uh, marketed by Ultima using an Ultima uh, chassis um, again did very well in kid car racing and uh, unfortunately that is no longer available which is a great pity because it's aluminium bodywork absolutely stunning. Now Kit Deal also went on to do a Lotus 23 replica and if you're thinking well Kit, Kit Deal, Ultima, Lee Noble, why all these Lotus? Let's not forget that Lee Noble started out in the Lotus um, uh, restoration and racing circuit. He was racing Lotuses before he started designing his own cars and that was his background so it was logical to make Lotus replicas and uh, his Lotus 23 was quite succe uh, successful. Now the Kelverdon Motors Lotus 47 replica was a, a, a replica of the racing version of the Lotus Europa and I don't know what happened with Kelverdon but uh, Banks later manufactured a 47 replica and uh, a standard uh, Lotus Europa replica and they also produced uh, replacement parts for repairing Lotus Europas I don't know whether banks are still going but uh, they were quite sought after and um, as I understand it, it probably the same car correct me if I'm wrong um, the CN Sprint now this was a little bit naughty what Christopher Neal who is a Lotus replica did uh, uh, wrote Lotus agent sorry did was he took factory body shells replacement body shells for Lotus Alans and he created a replacement chassis backbone chassis for the uh, uh, original Alan so you could take your original Alan running gear switch it over to the new chassis if you wanted to put the new body on and you had a, a, a restored Lotus Alan perfectly uh, perfectly fine but later he sort of went a bit further and developed the chassis to take Ford CVH engines and produce the kit as a complete car in its own right, a complete kit. And Lotus eventually, if I remember correctly, um, weren't too happy with this so it had to stop. And the Vegan Tune Avanti. Now there's no pictures here but that wasn't a kit car as such, but it was an evolution of the Elan. Original styling, kicked up rear end and a chin spoiler at the front, but using the Vegan Tune 140 brake horsepower cross flow twin cam. Absolutely glorious thing. If anyone out there has got a Vegan Tune Avanti, please let me know. Please invite me over. We would love to do a feature on you and your car because it is a forgotten sports car that deserves a bit more of a mention. A few more kit adverts but I'm taking up too much of your time so I won't go on through those. The build of um, a Magic. Now I've seen a few of these Score Hill Magics for sale. Some of them <laughs> incorrectly named as Dutton's. They're not Duttons. Score Hill Magic was a completely de separate thing, originally based on NGB running gear, later using Ford Cortina running gear, and by the account of this guy who built it, a bit more challenging than modern kits to build. So the GRP quality is said to be good, but it sounds like quite a difficult build. Linda Truins Melos. This is a young lady who built her own Dutton Melos, which is a lovely story in its own right. Um, and I'd love to know if this car is still out there. Um, and uh, 
Well, what can I say? It's um, it's it's just a lovely story. So, if anyone knows the whereabouts of that car and how it did, do let us know. It would be nice. Now, here's the first drive of a Countach, and it's a, by all accounts a Prover. It had a Chevy V8 in, so it would shift. But at this stage, it didn't have the windscreen in and was very much unfinished. Um, showed a lot of promise, but as we know, there are some Countach replicas that made it. So if you've built one, invite us over. We'll do a feature on you and your car, and you can actually go through what it was like to build one of these beasts and to live with it, because that would be a nice story. Now here's a photo of the Ultima Mark II, which effectively looks very much like the Mark I. It's squarer and uh, less rounded than the Mark III that went on to become very well known. But uh, this one was based on the Renault 30 or 25 running gear with the mid-mounted V6 engine and Lee Noble went into kick car racing and basically slaughtered everybody for a long time with it. Um, and that's how they kicked the um, Ultima legend began. I wonder if there's any Mark II still about. Have you got one? Let us know. Right, more from the kick car clubs. Ah, oh, a lovely little silver star there. Nimbus. An advert for the Nimbus. Now that was a very interesting car. Vauxhall Viva front suspension. Mini front subframe mounted in the back. GRP monocoque. Did very well in the early kit car racing series. 45-55 weight distribution if I remember correctly. Have you got one on the road? Let us know. And the Burlington Beretta. Now the Burlington Beretta was an incredible thing. You bought the plans, you had a Herald chassis or a, G or a Vitesse chassis, you made the, pl the, the plywood and aluminium panels and put them on the Herald chassis. Um, I don't know if the plans are still available. The Beretta differs from the original Arrow in having flowing wings. Now if you fancy one of these but you don't fancy building it and you haven't been watching our videos shame on you but in episode 6 of the alternative car show when we're at Baz um, we're with Baz at the kick car collection in the Netherlands if you're quick you can buy a Burlington Arrow which is actually built which is there he has one and Baz I want a commission if someone buys the car based on this, check out episode 6 of the Alternative Car Show. You will see a Burlington Arrow. And it's for sale. Right. Ah, the prototype Mark 1. Silver Striker. The original test drive. Now, I don't need to tell many of you out there just how successful the Silver Striker is in racing. They went on to produce at least a thousand, possibly two thousand between Silver and Raw who took on the project and I can tell you from all the 7S replicas that I've driven although my only criticism is that Jeremy Phillips is a short arse and the cockpit is very tight for someone as tall as me the Silver Striker is, by a country mile, the best handling 7 of any out there. I would say that I would rather have a Silver Striker than a Caterham 7. Honestly, I would. So, this is where the story began. And if you want to do yourself a favour, track down a, a Striker, buy it, put it on the road, and you'll see for yourself. It is an incredibly adjustable forgiving, beautifully, beautiful handling car, easily, for me, the best handling 7 out there, and 
the race performances and the race wins prove it. Um, from day one, they were winning races. So let's scoot through the rest of it. Ah, oh, the gecko. I have a soft spot for the gecko, I don't know why. Um, it's another Mokish car. There's a lot of these Mokish cars at the time. The Harbrun Special. Oh, I wonder if any of those still exist. Is there one out there? Teal cars, a beautiful replica of the Bugatti Type 35. And welding services. Now they became Tornado, if I remember correctly, or the car became the Tornado. And this is their GT40 replica. They went on to do a McLaren GT replica. And uh, the... Uh, we had one of those featured in part one of my Sweden road trip 2016. So check out that video and you'll see one of those. Now, the build project to build a Dutton Phaeton. For under £1,500. You see, that was the appeal of Dutton. You could have a sports car that was cheaper. And what, did, what Dutton did that I liked, that separated them from other seven manufacturers. It wasn't all about racing, it was about making a sporting road car, a lightweight sporting road car. So it still came with the option of hard tops, it came with a lockable boot lid. You could actually use this car for going away for a trip as you would an MGB. Okay, you needed side screens, but it was more practical than some of the other Lotus 7 replicas, people forget that, don't rule them out entirely based on reputation, rebuild one or find one that's been rebuilt properly and you'll still have a nice car. Ah, the Rickman Ranger. Now this is still a tempting car, it's a family car, looks like a Suzuki SJ410 and it's yeah, you, I've featured this in the last uh, magazine review, so I won't go too far into it, but it's actually a surprisingly uh, good quality, cheap family car. And I think people should get out there, buy them and restore them, because it's you can use it every day, and you can take your family. And there aren't that many kit cars around that you can do that with, and definitely none being produced today. Ah, the Minus. Now that was another mini body replacement with a GRP monocoque. It looked exactly like the Mini, apart from a squished down roof and, uh, or was it doors? Either way, it was lowered, but it was a reshell of the original Mini. And um, I wonder how many are still out there. The UVA Shogun Estate. A body kit to go onto your Volkswagen Beetle to turn it into a state. I wonder how many of those are still about. And that's it. And on the back, um, a feature of uh, a photo of the Mark III, if I'm correct, um, Dutton Sierra, or it could be the um, Reva. I can't remember. I'm sure. Adrian, oh sorry, it's the Dutton Shuttle. I can see the number plate. I uh, wonder if any of those survived. Right, that's enough of that. Don't forget, you can win this drone. We're doing a giveaway uh, in conjunction with our twin channel, which is Lifestyle Unleashed. I've put the link below, but basically to win this drone, all you need to do is go to www.com, oh, sorry, www.patreon.com forward slash nwin, make a pledge, $1, $3 or $10, which helps us make the videos that you're enjoying, and you go into the prize draw, when we get to 40, you can either win the drone or £40 in cash. Please go for the £40 in cash because I'd like to keep the drone. I've really grown attached to it. Thank you.
you for watching. Please click on like and of course subscribe so you can find out when we do more. And if you want to see the exclusive videos and see more, again, go to www.patreon.com forward slash Enwin.